Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Dr. Jonathan Metzel. Jonathan is a psychiatrist and author and a professor of sociology at Vanderbilt University. He's written several books, including The Protest Psychosis, Prozac on the Couch, Against Health, and the topic of today's conversation, Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland, which received the Robert F. Kennedy Award for Nonfiction. In Dying of Whiteness, Jonathan argues that GOP policies like cutting education funds, cutting taxes, opposing Obamacare, and opposing gun control are hurting the life expectancy of America's white population. In other words, hurting the very people who support these policies most. He also argues that support for these policies stems from racial resentment, a feeling of resentment towards minorities among white people. As you'll hear in the discussion, I don't agree that whiteness and racial resentment are the best explanations for why the median Republican supports these policies. And I also think that concepts like whiteness and blackness are toxic. I think people understandably hear these words as attacks on their racial identities, which they can't control. And so I think we should just rid the discourse of these words. Jonathan obviously disagrees, and we'll talk about that. That said, there are some smaller claims I agreed with Jonathan about, like the fact that the easy availability of guns in this country has made suicide easier for people, especially for the very population that opposes gun control laws. Some of his other claims about the effect of cutting school budgets on life expectancy I found to be poorly supported, and you'll hear me press him on that towards the middle of the episode. In general, I found that there was some distance between the tone of his book and the positions he was willing to defend in the room. And I don't know exactly how to handle situations like that as an interviewer. Do I just talk to the person I'm meeting in the room, or do I hold people accountable to the precise claims that they made in the book? I don't really know. Anyway, I'm grateful to Jonathan for coming on the podcast, and I hope you all enjoy the conversation as much as I did. So without further ado, Dr. Jonathan Metzel. Okay, Jonathan Metzel, thanks so much for being on my show. I'm really glad to be here. Okay, so um, we're going to get into your book, and and I'm going to put you in the hot seat and um, think of it like like defending your dissertation all over again. <laughs> I was saying before, this is the most comfortable hot seat I've ever... This is a very comfortable hot seat. So, Good. Yeah. So before we get to that, though, I want to know a little bit about your background, your biography. Where'd you grow up? How did you come to um, care about the issues at the intersection of race and health that led you to write this book, Dying of Whiteness. And um, so how'd you get here? Well, I think there are two parts of that. The professional part is I've had this career going back and forth between medicine and social science and politics, basically, and so, and humanities also. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I, I, I went through the whole med school route, but while I was going to med school, I snuck away and got a night degree in linguistic theory and poetry because mm. I always wanted to kind of add Med school humanity. wasn't enough. Med school wasn't enough. Uh, and then I took off some time to do um, another degree in mm. kind of politics. Mm-hmm. Then I went to residency, but I was actually, <laughs> sounds crazy now, going to night school. Um, so to, when did you sleep during your residency I'm plus night school? I'm sleeping now. I'm kind of catching up on everything. <laughs> um, but, but during my residency, I did a, a degree in... in um, poetry theory. And then I did a PhD after I finished my residency in critical race theory and politics. And so I've been kind of going back and forth between these worlds. And the whole time you're doing that, everybody's like, what are you going to do with your life? And it turns out there was a job. There was a job. Mm. Um, And so I I started at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. I was a professor of gender studies, African-American studies, and psychiatry for Mm -hmm. a long time and started a big center there that looked at culture and medicine. Mm -hmm. And then after about a decade of doing that, I was recruited to Vanderbilt to start a, uh, a new center called Medicine, Health, and Society that, again, looks at politics, race, um, medicine, health, and kind of how we got here. And so it's been a nice kind of career of building institutional space, kind of Mm. a place to study issues that I think are really important for medicine, but also for the world. Yeah. All right. So, um, so we're going to get into your book, Dying of Whiteness, um, which this came, it's a couple years old now, right? came out 2020. Uh, Is that right? Okay. So, um, I don't know how fresh it is in, in your memory, but I, I've just read it and, um, and, and, and so my first question is basically about the, the overall framework, right? Uh, 
the thesis, and I, I'm going to summarize it, and you tell me if you think this is a fair summary, is that GOP policy at the national and local level has had a deleterious effect on white health outcomes, on the population level white health, white, white health outcomes. We're talking life expectancy, disease, et cetera, mainly life expectancy and, and suicide rate. And we're talking about, when I say GOP policy, we're talking about tax cuts, we're talking about lax gun policy, uh, and we're talking about opposition to the Affordable Care Act mainly. And yet, Republicans seem to support such policies. And what's going on there, right? Um, you, you, you cite the famous book, What's the Matter with Kansas? Um, overall, that's, that's the thesis of, of your book. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I, I started adding it up. And I'll, we can talk about this later. But there was kind of an aha moment uh, mm -hmm. that kind of led to, led to the entire book. But I would say at the thesis level, I just started looking at the effects of population level health policies, like living in a state that blocked Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. um, overturned any any and every gun law uh, on the books, mm -hmm. blocked um, education, public education funding was another big one. Mm -hmm. And it kind of led into blocking public health funding, which kind of was a lead up to the pandemic. And what I found was the dichotomy that you've just mentioned, which is that on one hand, people were supporting these politics. They were voting for them. And then on the other hand, the actual medical biological effects of those policies on the people who were supporting them were as dangerous as living in a house with asbestos or secondhand smoke or not wearing a seatbelt in a car. They were literally causing a shortening of lifespan. The policies themselves were disease pathogens that were causing... You know, in, in some instances, weeks or months or years of shortened life expectancy or shortened quality of life years. And so I just um, looked at it from a data perspective and mm -hmm. a political perspective. And I found that these policies were functioning like disease pathogens, just like secondhand smoke. So we're going to I'm going to dig into those specific claims in a bit. But I want to 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 uh, get at the big picture framework here. So. It's one thing to say GOP policy is negatively affecting outcomes for white Americans. I think, I think many people might agree with some version of that claim. It's another thing to say those policies are well described as whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. What does the word whiteness or the concept of whiteness add to the diagnosis that GOP policies, certain GOP policies are bad for the country? Well, I hope I'm very clear in the book, and I'll be clear now, hopefully, which is that there are many ways to be white in this country. Um, you can be white and be communal, generous, responsible, building infrastructure, creating community. And so part of the question I ask in the book is, why is it that a particular version of what I call white racial resentment, this idea of a politics that is anti-government, anti-immigrant, um, very overtly or covertly racist, very pro-gun, kind of defending a way things used to be that they probably never were for many people. Why did that level of whiteness emerge in places where I'm from? I'm from Missouri. Um, I grew up in Kansas City. I live in Tennessee. Why did that become the do a dominant political mode of whiteness um, mm -hmm. in purple and red state America? Mm -hmm. And um, do you mind if I tell a vignette to explain? Go ahead. Uh, so the whole book came about because I was doing focus groups around the time that the Affordable Care Act was coming out. Mm -hmm. And we were doing these focus groups in rural Tennessee, a place that has horrible health outcomes for poor people across the board. And part of the story was um, – Leaving beliefs about government aside, the people I was interviewing, they were they really needed help. Like people with chronic liver failure, kidney failure, going bankrupt from not being able to afford their prescription drugs. And I understand government is complicated, it's bureaucratic, but I would do these focus groups and I would talk to people and I'd say, hey, there's this new thing. This was like 2012, 2013 called the Affordable Care Act. Are you going to sign up for it? And I'll never forget there was a guy, um, a, a guy named Trevor who I I spoke with who had, I think, liver failure or kidney failure. He really needed medical help. And he said, I realize I'm dying of my medical condition. 
Um, and I said, well, here's this thing called the Affordable Care Act that might be able to help you. You know, mm-hmm. you might get Medicaid expansion, um, more insurance coverage. And he said, I, I know what it would do for me, but to quote him, ain't no way I want my tax dollars going to help Mexicans or welfare queens. This mm-hmm. idea that basically I'm not signing up for a program that might help me if it also also benefits people who I see as undeserving. And I heard versions of that literally hundreds of times across my research where people basically said, yeah, these communal programs might be helpful for me, but I'm not going to participate in some program that I feel like there's encroachment of other people. And I heard it differently in in different ways for healthcare. So do you think that's like a a fair portrait of what the median Republican Republican feels, or do you think that's a fringe? I I, I don't know what the minority, I I don't know what the median Republican feels. I know that every time Medicaid expansion would go up for a vote um, in Tennessee, a state that was literally going bankrupt because it didn't have Medicaid expansion as opposed to Kentucky, which got a lot of help from the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tennessee, rural hospitals were closing. Um, People were getting thrown off insurance rolls. The poverty level kept, you know, uh, encroaching. But every time it would go up for a vote, um, what it meant to be a Republican, a conservative Republican, was to vote for a politician who was not going to allow Medicaid expansion to happen in Tennessee. That happens to this day. And so, so in my one question is like, is is the useful way to frame this whiteness, or and I could I can imagine an alternative framing would be partisanship, right? Because mm-hmm. there are all these, I'm sure you know, studies where Democrats or Republicans will be presented some policy say it's a gun control policy, you tell them Obama was in favor of it, Democrats will vote for it, Republicans will say no. You tell them Trump is supported the same policy and they'll flip. It's it's like this partisan bias where my party is right no matter what and, and the policy and everyone's either watching Fox News on the one hand or they're watching MSNBC, CNN, et cetera, and, and they just do that. So is to me that, when you, when you tell that story about well, I suppose about Trevor, he made it specifically about Mexicans and 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 welfare queens, et cetera. So that seems like a a, a racist motive. But if if I'm talking about like your typical Republican or your typical Democrat, to me it seems like the partisan bias is what would explain those kind of shooting oneself in the foot mm-hmm. kind of policies. No, and for sure we have we have. We have plenty of shooting oneself in the foot to go around right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like our whole system is set up to not solve problems. And so I, 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 it's not like and, – and, and the question of median, I mean, when I, when I say median, I'm not talking about the median desires of the aggregate Republican. I'm talking about mm-hmm. the median effect of the average GOP policy in these states. And so – and again, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about whiteness as a biological category, as a genetic category, um, nothing like that. I'm saying, did you support a policy that shortened your own lifespan? And so uh, the, the data So from, what is whiteness, though? Yeah. So for me, again, whiteness, and, and I talk about this a lot in the book, mm-hmm. there, um, it's not like I'm trying to define whiteness on some broad level. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would say again that the politics of what I call racial resentment, uh, the idea of a kind of anti-government, anti-immigrant, pro-gun, make America great again kind of politics, Mm -hmm. that that's really the operative definition in my book uh, in part. But I would also say that that came out in really complicated ways. Like half the book probably is about guns, Mm -hmm. where there is a very pronounced racial history of gun ownership, who gets to carry a gun in public, who Mm -hmm. is coded as a patriot and who is coded as a gangbanger. Mm -hmm. Um, It goes back a couple hundred years in our country. And so I look at the history of guns, which is very different from the history of healthcare. Um, Mm -hmm. But but that it's that had its own racial history that shaped present day politics. When I look at schools, there's a history of I look at Kansas because of Brown versus Board of Education. So this question of separate and equal and who is who has the right to be separate or equal. And so I'm looking at particular states that have particular racial histories about particular issues to say the history of race. Not that every person is racist. I don't think that. And I mm-hmm. also. I, I don't know. I think racism in a person is a very, it's a for me as a researcher, very fuzzy. Um, like I don't, I don't know who's racist, um, and many people act like they're not racist and they are, and I don't even know how to quantify that. But I can say mm-hmm. that there are racial histories about these issues in these states, which impact 
the policies and the outcomes. And so I'm really looking at um, guns, schools, and healthcare, the racial history of those issues and mm-hmm. how those racial histories shape the politics in the present day. Okay. So I, I'm, you know, I, I think framing it as sort of dying of whiteness, it's a no doubt controversial and, and to some people it'd probably be offensive way of framing it because they would hear it as you're attacking white people because they're white. Mm-hmm. And I think analogously, if someone said, oh, you're, you know, dying of blackness, a lot of black people, the, it, it wouldn't matter what you said after that because you're attacking my identity. Yeah. Uh, of course, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, right. As a scholar in America, you can make an argument that's offensive and you can defend it. And, and that, and the first amendment protects you. But there is, I think, a burden to prove that like what you gain from it is worth the p- potential turnoff factor mm-hmm. um, uh, to it. And I, and I wonder about that in a, in a time when we are so, I would argue, hyper obsessed with racial identity and we've cranked it to a 10. People, uh, it, it, I, I can imagine if I was a certain kind of white person, I would have to get over the feeling that you're you're asking me to get rid of my whiteness to buy your argument when really, you know, if you were to make it to me on the basis of like, this is a bad policy, then then I might be open to, to hearing it. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm super, I hope I'm, I hope I'm clear in the book and I'll be, again, say it now. I'm not asking anybody to apologize for their whiteness. Um, I'm obviously a white person. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I, I don't actually don't like Arguments where people are asked to apologize for who they are. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't think that that's taking people where they're at. And I. And I think. Um, I, I think we. I, I just. I mean, I've had to public debates about white fragility and mm. things like that. And I. I don't think that. Now, uh, two things I think are important for this. Mm. Uh, one, number one is I wrote this book, twenty twelve to twenty eighteen. Okay. Um, and so the book, you know, was in in production twenty nineteen. So. The issues. If I had to re, if I had to write it now, mm-hmm. maybe I wouldn't call it dying whiteness. Maybe I would. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that. How come? For the reasons you're saying, I think that mm-hmm. that the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd, all the reckonings, all the backlash we've had recently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think my argument holds. I mean, mm-hmm. I do think that if you look at the pandemic, for example, um, really what I'm asking is why is the performance of a particular political identity, which is charged by race Mm -hmm. at odds with longevity. Mm -hmm. And and I would say that, you know, you could maybe make the same argument for people who were anti-mask or anti-vax, that to be a good conservative citizen and many Mm -hmm. other people as well, Mm -hmm. um, by some research accounts led to shortened lifespan or more right. health or something like that. So really what I'm saying is why is the performance of So were those like mask or anti-vax policies were those about race? Well, the the history of the book I'm telling in my book and I don't talk about mask or vax in in, in my book uh, because it came out before. Yeah. Um and so and I, again I just cannot be clear enough I'm not talking about every white person everywhere. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. about the aggregate effects and also for people who've read the book they know that it's not just like white people are dying of these policies. Like when states like Tennessee didn't expand Medicaid, the people who were affected the mm-hmm. most were um, black and Latino uh, citizens who had not had health care or education um, in the first place. And the, and the promise of the Affordable Care Act was that they were finally going to get uh, health care. And so people were dying of all different con- – I mean, it mm-hmm. wasn't just white people who were – affected by this, but it was conservative white GOP politics that was blocking healthcare for, for everyone really in a way. And so, um, and so, um, what was the question? Well, I mean, you had just mentioned sort of vax, but I'll, I'll kind of, I'll I'll pivot to a different question though. Um, another way of looking at this is when I look at say anti-immigrant sentiment in America, I don't think of it as a white issue. Like I, th- I think Black Americans are pre- have pretty broadly similar attitudes towards mm. border control, and that you can see that in like the how um, how Black Californians voted on 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 immigration in the '90s on the California uh, prop the, those uh, resolutions that they have. It's like very broadly comparable, right? So is that about whiteness or is that about a broad 
and uh, global tendency that people have to not want more immigration. And many black And insofar Americans, as yeah. we talk about it as whiteness, yeah. don't white people feel singled out like, hey, hold on, my black neighbor doesn't want open borders either, doesn't mm-hmm. want more immigration. How come I'm the only one that's called a xenophobe for it? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and many black Americans voted for Trump and probably will vote for the GOP candidate. An increasing number of Latino Americans mm-hmm. vote for GOP. So I'm, I'm not just saying... Let's all vote for Democrats. <laughs> in fact, the book I'm writing now is very critical of Democrats for many of the reasons we're talking about, okay. which is making moral assumptions about people who are politically different. Uh-huh. Um, and so it's not like I'm adverse <laughs> to that argument. In fact, when we talk again in six months, if we do, yeah. you'll see I have a whole book about <laughs> about the moral assumptions about public health. I don't think it's neutral. Um, but And so, I'm again, I just, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the health outcomes uh-huh. of policies and the ways that those policies use racial resentment to further their aims of getting implemented in the first place, Mm -hmm. acknowledging that there are, I mean, I don't call anybody racist in the book. Mm -hmm. I don't talk about people's individual intentions. I say Mm -hmm. very clearly, I don't know who's racist. And, Mm -hmm. and there are many people of many different backgrounds I know (laughs) from my own life growing up. And so, and so certainly there are many people, um, but the idea uh, yeah. is that these policy positions are motivated to some extent by racism, by, right? like the gun, gun lax attitude towards gun control, tax cuts and lowering funding, et cetera, that part of that, one part of that is motivated by racism against minorities, right? And racial resentment. It's not just racism against minorities. Well, what is racial resentment? The idea I mean, that, I, I've, I've seen the scales, yeah. but can you help? people with that help me with that in a too. nutshell it's the fear that other people are going to come take your stuff okay. or that people are going to cut in front of you in line uh in in the push for resources i mean when i was doing the affordable care act interviews for example uh-huh. people kept telling me black people are having 12 to 14 kids there ought to be a cutoff point somewhere mm-hmm. and by the time i go to the doctor they're going to have run out of whatever mm-hmm. li- fill in the blank and there's not going to be enough for me or something like that so this idea that basically other people are Undeserving people are taking away, taking your resources, your... So, I mean, but by, I get that. And I get that that's not quite racism, right? That's something lesser Mm -hmm. on the spectrum. It seems to me what you're describing is also how a lot of black people feel about white people embodied in the white privilege meme. It's like the idea is white people are undeservedly taking resources and stuff Mm -hmm. that belongs to us, Right. But I've, I've never heard it called racial resentment in that direction because, again, I think I, I, I fear a lot of this, uh, the way these things are named and selectively thrown around, the subtext of all of it is that white people are wrong and everyone else, everyone else can sleep easy on this issue, which strikes me as like a big problem and, and a very divisive way of, way of framing the issue. So like, is, is it racial resentment when black people feel this way about white people? Um, you know, I guess the question for me, just to reframe your question mm-hmm. would be, what are my outcomes of writing a book like this? Yeah. And the reason I'm pushing back a little bit is because I, my book is not white fragility. My book is not even anti-racism. I'm not talking about changing people's hearts and minds. No, I, I get that. Yeah. I, I get that. It's just, um, I, I get that. Uh, and, and let me, uh, and let me so say. So I'm not asking you that question, but I, I do, I, I do wonder about these things. Yeah. Um, I, I grew up in Missouri, right, as I write about in the book. Uh-huh. I've seen structures built through common efforts between people <clears throat> that lead to common infrastructures that lead people to feel like they're in cooperation with each other, not in competition with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, when I grew up, everybody in Kansas City would send their kids to these public-funded Taxpayer funded summer camps where mm. everybody in town would send their kids for three weeks to sleep outside. Mm. Um, and you would meet all kinds like of state funded summer camps. Yeah, city, city mm-hmm. funded summer camps. Yeah. Swope Park Camp for anybody yeah. listening from Kansas City. Um, and you would meet kids from every racial, ethnic, political background. Mm-hmm. And it was funded by the city. Mm-hmm. And you would meet, you know, you'd make lifelong friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were public pools that everybody went to in the mm-hmm. middle of town. Everybody went to these public pools and you would meet, you would, you know, sports teams, all these kind of things. And so in Missouri, when I grew up, 
a um, couple decades ago, we had a system where taxpayer money was used to create infrastructure where people could meet people who were different than them and not see them as evil. Mm. And, um, and all of that went away. The minute we started doing like the, um, you know, anti-tax movements like the Tea Party and the Freedom Caucus, the minute more guns flooded into the area, the minute politics became polarized, the first things that got cut were these common infrastructures, these infrastructures where people could go. Mm-hmm. And so part of the reason I wrote the book is to say, in my own lifetime, I've seen us do better. And mm-hmm. Heather McGee makes a similar argument in her, her book, The Sum of Us, about the closing of public pools. Mm-hmm. And I've seen programs like those summer camp programs that I grew up in Mm. proposed again and again, and they continue to get shut down. And so what I'm arguing for, again, I'm not arguing for hearts and minds. I'm arguing let's build common infrastructure where people can see the value of cooperating, collaborating, Mm -hmm. and not fall back on zero-sum formulations where we feel like racial groups are in competition with each other or people who are politically different than us are – bad people in a way, which is our, which is what our whole system is right now. Mm -hmm. Um, when they were proposing the affordable care act the first time around, you know, 2008, nine, 10, they had this idea, how can we get people in a city or a community to work together to improve their health outcomes across the aggregate level of a community? Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they had this plan that was if an entire town builds bike lanes that connect different neighborhoods, Mm -hmm. builds public parks. They lower their emergency room visits. They um, lower their blood sugar and their systolic blood pressure. If the entire town does this, then everyone gets a tax cut. The whole town will get a tax cut because you're wasting less money on ER visits. Mm. And I thought, man, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I'm a structuralist. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to, again, change people's heart, whatever. Um, But I will say this is exactly what I'm talking about, which is this idea that we could build structures where people were cooperating toward a common aim, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants a tax cut. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, this would be great. This would be a way to get people to to cooperate, even if you're not talking to them about their deep-seated fears or resentments, but instead build these structures. Now, the thing I'm telling you with the Affordable Care Act was one of the first things that got chopped. It never saw the light of day. But I kept thinking, like, that's a modern-day example of the thing I saw with the parks and the schools, Mm -hmm. which is how can we build structures where people are not in competition with each other for resources, which is the world we have now. And I'm I'm not trying to not answer your question. I'm just Mm -hmm. giving you the way I think about this, um, which is... Which is, um, I mean, I, anti-racism is one approach, which is let's make people aware of things. And I think it's super important. But I'm saying um, I think that changing everybody's attitude is not going to matter if you don't intervene, if you don't have a foresight at the structural level to think about how you can get people to feel like they're on the same page. And conversely, if you want people to be at odds with each other, to feel the most resentment between groups – The best way to do that would be to drain all the money that people have toward bridges and schools and healthcare and parks and give it in the form of tax cuts to wealthy people and corporations. So you're draining all the money and then people really are in competition with each other for limited resources. And so austerity and what we might call racial resentment or tribal resentment, I don't know what you call it, austerity is a driver of that of that phenomenon too. And so in a way, we've just stopped investing in the conduits through which tribes of people feel like they're together. We've mm-hmm. invested in tribalizing media, tribalizing politics, tribalizing judges. Our whole system is monetized for people to be at odds with each other. And, and then we're seeing the natural outcome of it. And so... The, that was a very long way of saying, yes, there are black people that are racist. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are brown people that are racist. Um, but but what does that tell us? That that tells us many things, but it also tells us that we're in a system where we feel like we're fighting, you know, we're six mice fighting for, you know, two pieces of cheese or something, which is the way the American system is set up right now. So if I were to summarize you, what you just said and tell me if you think this is a fair summary – Say, when we defund things, when we defund public education, et cetera, when we, when we cut the budget, we're all now fighting over a smaller pie in some way, and it brings out the worst in all of us. It makes us more liable to blame racially and to resent racially and so forth. And also we think in terms of competition. Zero sum. 
I think it's absolutely zero sum. People are, we think in terms of competition with other groups, um, as opposed mm -hmm. to thinking, um, man, there's enough for everybody <laughs> or something like that, which is not yeah. our system. Right. Well, okay. So if I look at like what, what I've seen over the past 10 years is that, and, and there's this Gallup poll I often cite just that ask Americans like how you feel about race relations. And it was basically most Americans, black and white, like 60 to 70% felt good mm -hmm. until 2013. And then it just like starts spiking. It starts, sorry, nose diving. 2013. 2013. Yeah. It's like, it's a Gallup poll they have. They've been asking it since 2001 and it's just pretty much pretty steady until 2013. And then nose dives from steadily from 13, 2013 to 2021, like cuts in half, both <laughs> black and white Americans. What happened in 2013? So what I would say what happened in 2013 is a couple things. I think everyone had a smartphone in their pocket and everyone had social media. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> and so our perceptions of pre-2013, like our perception, my perception, let's say, I was kind of a kid at that time, but my perception of race relations would be like, how am I treated on a daily basis by my neighbors, by my classmates? Um, how often do I experience a racist incident, which at that time would have been very rare for me where I grew up. Um, how, uh, and then like what I see on the six o'clock news, right? Post 2013, my picture of race relations is like a new article every day from Buzzfeed or Huffington post, um, uh, a video of a black person getting killed by the police, you know, every month that circulates on Facebook in a matter of minutes and could be even a misleading or out of context clip. Um, and the algor algorithm algorithmically boosted content is precisely the content which is most divisive. If you live in red America, the stuff you're getting is like, <clears throat> you know, a constant drip of articles about illegal immigrants committing crimes, right? And you're seeing that pre-2013, you wouldn't have seen that so algorithmically boostedly in your pocket all the time, everyone filming everyone. And I think that led to in substantial measure, it led to the BLM movement. So I don't think the BLM movement is the cause. I think it's also caused by the same phenomenon, which is like this social media smartphone revolution. And to me, that is by far the bigger driver of poor race relations today than like, uh, you know, budget changes or GOP budget cuts and, and, and such. Like, I mean, so what, what do you think of that? I mean, thesis? it's interesting if you think about, um, you know, I was talking, my last very long answer was about structure uh -huh. and it seems like the entire monetary structure of intergroup relations now is monetized around conflict. Mm -hmm. And so social media is a great example. If you go on and you say, I'm a Democrat, but some Republicans are nice. You'll get two re two clicks. Yes. It won't make any money for anybody. Mm -hmm. It's this, the algorithm will not support you saying that. Right. Um, if you go on and say, I walked down the street and a damn Republican threw some shade at me and blah, blah, blah. And then people respond to that and then it goes on. It mm -hmm. kind of circulates. Mm -hmm. That's how people make money. So we, we, mm -hmm. the social media algorithms depend on conflict, which of course is so ironic because social media was supposed to be this thing that That's right. <laughs> brought us all together, That's right. that kind of thing. But so that money, That's that, how it that was sold. The, and so, um, conflict is the way we learn about other groups right now. A lot mm -hmm. of times in, in some ways, not all, but in some ways it's how we think about them, but it's not just social media. I mean, think about our political system. For example, people are elected to go in and hold the party line, they're not elected, try being a centrist, try being, you know, Mitt Romney or mm -hmm. somebody you're seen as a traitor. Mm -hmm. um, and so our whole political system is who's going to go in and be the most, the most ardent defender of for me and against you. Mm -hmm. um, judges never used to be politicized, but now judges, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go in and listen to the argument and let's l let the chips fall where they may. Judges are elected based on the ideologies that they go in to uphold. Um, so we have a political, judiciary, media environment and many other environments where there's tremendous amount of money in in polarization, in us versus them, in winning ver by <laughs> however much and then pushing the other side down or something like that. And so does social media reflect that? Does it cause that? It's probably a little bit of both. 
Um, but again, I'll, I don't mean to over idealize Kansas City, uh-huh. but I will say I read about this in the book. Um, I was looking back through the election process in in Missouri mm-hmm. um, it, before 2000. Um, if there was a chairmanship of a key political committee that was a, within 500 votes of some some vote for some kind of seat or something like that. They would rotate the chairmanship of the committee every month, uh, a power sharing agreement, because they figured, hey, a lot of people care about this on both sides. Mm -hmm. So everyone should get their say in a representative democracy. Again, these are like the good old days. Um, But I would just say that we don't have that now. It's kind of like like Trump, like get me one more vote than the other guy so I can wipe them out. Mm -hmm. And so – our, our whole system, there's just there's no reward for compromise in our system, which leads to exactly that tribalism. Mm-hmm. And social media is exactly an example of that. Yeah. Okay. So that said, uh, the book you wrote is largely about GOP policy, right? So it, in in it's a book Democrats would have liked and and Republicans would have would have hated certainly. I mean, I wouldn't. No. I've, been, I've done a lot. Maybe of, not. I've been on a lot of conservative media. I've gone back to the communities I've interviewed mm-hmm. and talked to them about the book. We've read the book together. So I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that. I try to be very respectful of the people I'm writing about. Um, I don't. I try not to. I try to listen to people. I write in the book a lot. Mm-hmm. That if I would have met people who I meet in the book on social media, we would have hated each other. Um, but. Right. When I live right. with them, I realize like there are all these other most things. Most people we, get along in real life. Most I mean, people get along in real life. And, yeah. and even just last week, I was mm-hmm. back um, engaging with some of the people I talked to in, in the gun section. And so mm-hmm. I, I, I hope that GOP people wouldn't wouldn't hate the book. Um, yeah, I think uh, I meant less rank and file voters, but your I mean, I think some of your claims about a GOP policy are strike me as a bit extreme in, in the sense that it's like there's kind of blood on the, the hands of some of these policies. And I think I agree with that in some cases and maybe less in others. So, for example, the idea that cutting the the budget for a school will lead to uh, more dropouts, right? A higher dropout rate and a higher dropout rate is associated with uh, – uh, if you don't drop out of high school, you, you, you say in the book – uh, that's associated with a nine year, nine years less life expectancy, Something right? Like five to nine, yeah. Five to nine. So let's assume it's nine or whatever. Um, and then you say, well, I think it was Kansas, right? Kansas cut the budget. A couple hundred, six hundred, seven hundred kids couldn't, didn't graduate high school as a result. So taking that at face value, that led to six thousand white lost life years, right? But it seems when I hear that, I think the hidden premise here is that not uh, is that not graduating high school causes you causes your lifespan to go down by nine nine years when I feel that that's probably more likely a correlation, right? Like it's probably like poverty causes you to not graduate high school and causes your life expectancy to be lower, et cetera. And yet the way that that's framed, it's basically this policy is taken out 6,000 years off of <laughs> your life. And that, that feels like a very, you know, like, uh, I, I think dubious way to frame it. Well, um, and hopefully we'll get to guns because I feel like the data is really, str- do really strong on guns. We're going to do that next. Um, but, but, but I would say that, um, so the, the, the shortened lifespan from high school dropout is that, and, and I'm clear about this. That's not my research. In other words, I'm using somebody else's model, another published model, mm-hmm. which basically said that if you just study people who don't make it through high school, drop out before high school, mm-hmm. they have um, worse job, worse diet, worse ass, works, worse ass, worse um, ass, access to health care. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in a couple of models in these public health articles that I was talking at, which I mm-hmm. kind of say, okay, let's take that, let's take that at face value, even mm-hmm. though that could be true, that could not be true. I, that was not the research I was doing, mm-hmm. but I'd say, let's just take that at face value because I guess it does kind of make maybe emotional sense when you think about it. Like if you don't have a job, if you don't have a job, if you like poverty maybe is linked to not graduating high school, it's not, ca- it's not causal. Mm-hmm. But I said, let's take that number at face value. Mm-hmm. 
but I, but I think the data that is really strong, which was mm-hmm. my data, which is the before and after of draconian budget cuts to Kansas, the Kansas public education system. So I can say mm-hmm. that the before and after of literally eviscerating public school budgets in mm-hmm. Kansas led to changes in, you know, increasing class size, decreasing teacher funding, decreasing after school programs. De- I mean, all these kind of things mm-hmm. um, that led to worse schools, schools closing, and people started not making it through high school. So mm-hmm. I said, let's just take this five to nine year data. What I can show you is the before and after of these tax cuts. What happens? And then I just applied those two things to each other. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that dropping out of high school caused that to happen. But I can tell you— It does read that way. I have to. I can't let you off the hook yeah, because yeah. it really does read that way. What I can tell you is that cutting the budget— Yeah. Cutting the budget leads to dropouts. I have very strong data okay. about that. Cutting the budget— That's interesting in its own right. And cutting the budget leads to decreasing employable skills, right? That's the other thing we see in Kansas is mm-hmm. that skills like science— uh, proficiency, um, critical thinking, reading, all those things start falling on national tests on fourth, eighth, and 12th grade national tests. They all Mm -hmm. start falling after the budget cuts. Now, I don't know. I didn't go in and say like, oh, you took these $10 and this test score. But I can tell you, if you look at the graphs in the book, it's pretty powerful what happens to education outcomes and dropout rates after the tax cut. So that I will definitely go to the mat on. Mm -hmm. And then I said, let's do a thought experiment, which is here's this whole body of literature that says that these things lead to shortened lifespan. Mm -hmm. I see that as a debatable point. I'm very happy to debate that. I don't think that it's A leads to B. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that if you apply these two things, which is here's the thing that I know caused high school dropouts, Mm -hmm. and here's a literature that says that dropping out causes this, let's merge those two things and see what we find. Um, But again, I think the thing that I would want to stand firm on is massive budget cuts, defunding an education system leads to worse outcomes. So... um Right before we get to to gun control, um, because this is your area, what did you uh, what did you make of our sort of national COVID policy re um, school closures? Because this is this was, it was a point of contention, and at the beginning, the people saying open open <laughs> schools were were quite vilified, like the the Emily Osters of the world, and then and again I. I I imagine you'd be probably closer to this literature than I am. I'm not like reading all the papers or anything, but my my impression has been that there's an emerging consensus that school closures that went on too long had had a deleterious effect on test scores, on you know learning loss, this learning loss problem. So how how have you viewed that? Well. Um it's not my research. Yeah, <laughs> um, fair enough. Uh, you know, the interesting thing for me about the pandemic is that I was, I go back and forth between New York and Tennessee. So okay. I was, I had a blue state, red state pandemic for <laughs> the most like, part. I've heard stories of people that they will go to a red state and get yelled at for wearing a mask. And then they'll come to New York and get yelled at for not wearing a mask, <laughs> it, it which was, I was once or twice uh, <laughs> outside, outdoors, of course. Um, it was... Um, it was interesting because I will say the first three, four months of the pandemic, I was in Brooklyn mm-hmm. and it was probably the most, one of the most terrifying things I could ever imagine. It felt mm-hmm. like what, it just felt like the end of the world. Sirens were going all the time. Yeah, I remember. People yeah. we knew died. People's parents were dying. It was, it was literally terrifying. I don't think, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I feel like when I got back to Tennessee, they had had a pandemic, but it was it was nowhere. not quite what New York City. Yeah, no, there was yeah. nothing like that, and so there yeah. was this moment of terror where you just wanted the monster to stop eating people. Like it's just uh-huh. honestly, that's what it felt like. Mm-hmm. And I feel like those first few months, in other words, I keep thinking like, what would the pandemic have been like if it would have started in Miami or in? Um, How do you think it would have been different? Just New York was like the worst place for it to start because of the population density, because of the ways that like in another city, you could just get in your car and go to the drive through New York. A lot of people don't have cars. Mm -hmm. Um, The whole city is based on things that work for a city, but we're also like 
incredibly good for COVID transmission. Yeah. And so the time that we were the most vulnerable was the time where the pandemic first hit. And mm. so I, f I guess I feel like when I was in New York, there was something terrifying about letting kids go to school because then they were going to come back and like kill the whole family. Like it's just kind of what it felt like. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to Tennessee, it just felt like, I mean, it was six months maybe into the pandemic at that point. People live much more spread out. They have their cars. The pandemic wasn't being reported in the same way. And it just felt like a totally different experience. And so I, I don't know. I feel like... I feel like so many of the policies that we had in the beginning of the pandemic were like those urgent New York early months kind of things. Mm -hmm. And the assumption was, well, that's what's going to happen to the rest of the country if we don't stop this now. I don't think it was like mean spirited. I think mm -hmm. if somebody from like rural Tennessee would have been in New York for the first four months of the pandemic, they probably would have been really scared also because it was just, it was really scary. And so I guess it's just, we had different pandemic experiences in the country. And mm -hmm. the hard thing was we tried to mandate policy for all these different areas without realizing that different regions were having different pandemic experiences. I, I don't know about schools. Obviously I think probably holding out kids too long did have I mean, it seems it, in, indisputable now that that had bad educational outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's just funny to think of like where that where that all came from. And I don't know if you would have asked me two months into the pandemic when those sirens were twenty four seven, mm -hmm. I would have been like, kids never go to school again and <laughs> just keep them home. Right. Yeah. No, I was I was very in favor of the first lockdown as a New Yorker, and um, e even with hindsight, I think look hindsight is twenty twenty. But I would defend it on the grounds that um, it, I'd rather, in the very early days of a pandemic, I would rather overreact than underreact, mm -hmm. given that perfect reaction generally isn't on the menu in, a, in an evolving situation. I would rather err on the side of overreaction. And then once we really know what we're dealing with, we know, have more data after a month or two, that's when it should we should try to get the optimal policy. So yeah. I, because I, I know some people were against the first lockdown. Um, I think that argument, become, the anti-lockdown argument becomes much more persuasive when you talk about the second uh, lockdown or third lockdowns that certain places had. And the virus itself um, stopped infecting the lower lungs, right? Which meant that mm -hmm. if it was an upper respiratory inf infection, like the, the- In the later strains. Yeah, yeah the later strains. Yeah. So it was also literally a different kind of pandemic a couple mm -hmm. of months into the pandemic. Um, and so- um, so I just I just think we 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 too easily conflate things. Now mm -hmm. I, I, I'm I'm a huge critic of different aspects of the policy, but I do feel like there's a fair bit of Monday mor Monday morning quarterbacking. Mm -hmm. um, linked to my book, um, I would also say that we don't we don't know the effect of what the pandemic was in a place like Tennessee or mm -hmm. um, or Florida. A lot of places that kind of un eviscerated the data gathering gathering process. But I would also say that the flip side of this school argument, which again, I'm admitting there was probably mistakes made. Um, but, uh, but we had a chance to like expand Medicaid in non-expansion states, for example, when there was a pandemic and everybody needed healthcare. And we politicized the pandemic from a conservative angle also in ways that I think are kind of falling out of this conversation about overkill, which mm. certainly we did. Mm -hmm. um, but like, we had a moment in May, June, July to like give everybody health care in this entire country, for example, mm -hmm. which is something we should have done on the flip side. Like maybe the pandemic would have been a lot better if people didn't wait until they were needing to be in the ICU before they went to the hospital and, and things like that. So I just feel like there's a lot of blame in retrospect mm. because we fell back. We fell back on these political identities. We politicized the pandemic. We did. Um, so let's get off the pandemic and get on to gun policy, which is a, a major theme in, in the book. Uh, I guess the, the question is, you know, first question is just m make the case to a skeptic listening. Imagine there's someone, I'm not, I'm not really a big gun guy myself and I'm pro common sense gun control measures. I think it should be much harder to get a legal gun than it is. And it's insane that we have people mentally ill kids walking into a store, basically coming out with a gun and then killing people, yeah. whether that is for mentally ill reasons or for hate crime reasons, it should be harder to get a gun than to, to 
get like a car, right? It, it took, takes a while. It took a while for me to get my driver's license, right? I had to go through all these hoops, and the hoops create a higher barrier to entry for for dangerous people, for people who who want to do harm with that. And that you thing. have insurance for your car, and you have to That's reach right. a certain age when you get to get your car. Like all, you know, we know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that that's my position. On the issue, um, but can you make uh, make your case to to a gun skeptic that, or to a gun control skeptic, that guns are a a threat to the white population health or population health in general? Well, I again, I grew up in Missouri, and I was born on an Air Force base. Like, it's not like I have not, I've been around guns a lot my entire life. It's not like I'm. Anti-gun. I know a lot of people who own guns, who have guns for hunting or because they've been handed down in their families. So I grew up in a place where a lot of people own guns. It's not like I thought every person, oh, you're a right person with a gun, you're some kind of problem. But in the book, I tell the before and after story of what happened to Missouri, where I'm from. Missouri had a permit process in place until about 2008, mm -hmm. um, which was a process where if you wanted to buy a gun, just like you were just saying, mm. you had – it was – Less than a driver's permit, but it wasn't nothing, right? You had to um, do a questionnaire, get a very cursory background check. The question was basically, are you going to kill somebody, yes or no? It was, it, you know, it took, I interviewed people who were part of that. And it process. was like swipe or no swiping. You had to tell the truth, yeah. right? <laughs> well, I mean, it was, it was a joke because I talked to people and they were like, yeah, it was largely pro forma. And we do pro forma things. Uh -huh. I mean, think about when you go to the airport and they used to ask you, like, is anyone unknown to you packed your bag? Like, nobody who's Mm -hmm. is going to blow up the plane is going to say, right. oh, yeah. Actually, okay. Osama bin Laden packed yeah, my bag. Yeah, Thank totally. you for asking. Thank you for asking. Um, but there was like a, just a, there was a level of oversight mm -hmm. that was not just about an individual making up their own choice, mm -hmm. which gave the state data. It gave the state information. There was also information on particular guns so that if a gun was involved in a crime, they knew who, the, who who's at least who owned the gun. Mm -hmm. um, and so they could maybe track back and find the person who, who committed the crime. Yeah. And so there was this process, which was far from perfect, but it didn't really bother anybody. I interviewed a lot of sheriffs and a lot of um, pawn shop op owners because they were selling a lot of guns in Missouri. And they were like, yeah, this whole thing took about five minutes every time you'd make a gun sale. It really wasn't that big of a deal. But when the And you had nothing to worry about if you weren't a criminal, and exactly. et cetera. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so, but then there was this move to overturn every gun law mm. um and and it, and it was driven not just by the politics of Missouri uh the Supreme Court was involved in in some cases where did that come from uh before maybe uh before the late 1980s i want to say um we we have a second amendment which is like a rorschach test um anybody who thinks they have a definitive interpretation is lying um, because mm -hmm. it's it's very vague the Second Amendment, but we interpreted this idea of of militias. We interpreted it to say that was for militaries, mm -hmm. and then in about the in about the nineteen eighties, the NRA, which was a sportsmen's organization before, started saying, "Well, we can get involved in the political arena by pushing this narrative that the Second Amendment actually is meant to." to call individual people militias, that it's actually about the rights of citizens, mm -hmm. not about the rights of um, armies. Mm -hmm. And so this was a push that they funded politicians, they funded, um, they, they, it was, it, I was looking at it in the book, they, they claim to have uncovered new and never before seen evidence that the original framers of the Constitution intended for the Second Amendment to mean the individual right to carry arms. They still have not released what that information is, but people bought it. And Orrin Hatch led a committee on the Senate Joe Biden was on that committee uh, at the time, uh, and that was a push for when Ronald Reagan started to get involved in politics. He became an NRA-funded politician. And so there was a push starting in the 1980s that basically gun ownership was an individual right that was against the government, not to support, go not to support the government. You're defending mm -hmm. yourself against the tyranny of the government, government, which people didn't think in 1970, but they did by the year 2000. One quibble, though, like— what, the pre, the 1970 take on the Second Amendment, wouldn't that have been our state is potentially having a militia to defend ourselves against, say, the federal government or no? I mean, does, would, that, would that fly right now? 
Well, it wouldn't fl- now. Well, I'm just saying in your framework where it first was about a militia, yeah, and then it became about personal individual gun ownership through this lobby. Even when it was about a militia, it could it could have st- still had like an anti federal government. Um, I there are two rationale, things. right? Yeah, because I mean, is, you know, the, obviously the word militia is because it was all all of this was was made when like a state militia would have been super important. Yeah, in seventeen seventy or seventeen eighties. But but yeah. also, you know, people who study the history of the Second Amendment, there's the, this great book I cite in the in the book about how really the aim of this militia argument was to empower people to be able to track down escape slaves. So the mm-hmm. militias were, it was not fighting the British. It was mm-hmm. to punish escape slaves. And so mm-hmm. there's a whole history of kind of what that word militia means that is not mm-hmm. neutral. Um, mm-hmm. But, but I would say that, um, you it, know, on the other hand, you know, I have to say, I have a, I have a problem when people make these arguments from history, right? Because for example, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, he, I think he was speaking at the NRA, uh, last week and he he goes well actually gun control laws have a racist history because after the civil war as you know the black codes were <laughs> instituted to control whether black people could get guns right and and occupational licensing laws have a ra- racist history for that reason does that mean we should feel weird about those policies today i would say absolutely not yeah and again, people on the left made the same argument. Well, did you know the police originated in slave patrols? It's like, I don't care. Yeah. Actually, I don't care. That doesn't, that shouldn't inform my perspective on these issues today. Right, right. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan, the Knight Riders, they were in part, their aim was to take guns away from black people, right? So there's a whole history, a racist history of taking guns away from black people um, when Stokely. There's a racist history to like every policy. The ones, whoever <laughs> were, you are, yeah. the ones you like have a racist history. <laughs> um, look up Planned Parenthood's co-founder, eugenicist or whatever. Yeah. The ones you don't like have a racist history. So let's all chill with this. But but I would say the the, the key point for me is before before this started happening, and really it kind of reached its pitch in 2008 when mm-hmm. the Supreme Court... Um, passed um, really a landmark uh, a landmark um, gun case that basically mm-hmm. said the individual right people have a right to have a gun in their home um, mm-hmm. which was never kind of at policy before and and if you just look at at um, why people own guns like Pew Pew opinion polls for example if you look before <laughs> all this happened maybe 80 percent of gun owners said they owned guns for hunting mm-hmm. and i think it was 16 or 17 percent of people owned guns to protect themselves against other people and now self-defense is the self-defense main defense is it's yeah. like eight to one and so right. and Interesting. so we, so the more there were guns the more people started to fear oh the other guy might have a gun also which mm. i think is kind of off to the races so i saw a guardian article and i don't know if folks trust the guardian necessarily but it, it said in 2001 there was a 58 percent increase in black gun ownership which is staggering to me if true now i'm not 2001? saying 2021 yeah yeah no that's true that is true yeah that's amazing to me that's like that's i can't believe i hadn't heard that fact and something like 30 percent of no, maybe maybe twenty. I think it was twenty four percent of black people say they own guns, as opposed to thirty six percent of white people, according to Pew. Um, and that that's a. Uh, I mean, the, the article had various theories about why that is. What what's causing this huge spike? But basically, it's like people are afraid. They watch the news. Black people are afraid they're going to get killed by. They see Ahmad Arbery get killed by a white guy yeah. in two thousand twenty. I believe it was. And they think, I need a gun. Um, white people, they see crime on the news. They see people, they see someone get shot by an illegal immigrant or something. They think, I need a gun. Um, no matter how likely, how rare this actually may be for their family. And look, I don't, I, I actually, I don't think it's necessarily the wrong decision to get a gun because I just, you know, I saw, I saw the other day people in San Francisco they're like their houses are getting robbed and the police don't even come because they have so neutered and destroyed their, their police force. It's like, if you, if you want to get a gun to protect yourself, I get it. 
On the other hand, there is this risk that you talk about in the book of um, like accidental uh, gun deaths, people not securing their guns properly, uh, and, and and all the rest. So, well, and let me be clear. Go ahead. Um, by far the biggest cause of gun death in this country, not even close as gun suicide. And so, and now um, I agree with you. If I lived in a place where people were getting their homes broken into eight times and the cops weren't coming. I'd get a gun. Um, but I also think the very fact that we're at that stage shows the breakdown of the social infrastructure. In other words, I think social spaces should be safe. The minute we're having individuals buy guns to protect their property and and the stuff you're talking about, about black Americans buying guns, mm-hmm. there um, in my new book, I'll come out in six months and I've got a lot on this, mm. but there were very conscious marketing campaigns by the NRA Mm -hmm. targeted at black Americans Mm -hmm. using George Floyd imagery to basically say the cops aren't going to protect you. And so you need a gun or something like that. And so Uh there are a lot of factors as to why. Were they wrong? I'm not sure that was wrong. Do you see what happened in Minneapolis? Yeah. You know, like they, they destroyed the police force, historic crime rates, single, the biggest one year increase in the homicide rate, Mm -hmm. according to Pew in 2020. Again, you know, my, one can blame it on the targeted ads, but it's like reflecting a truth. Yeah. Well, I would say the minute we're having individuals arm themselves for issues that should be solved by social infra- and communal infrastructure, we have we have a bigger problem. <laughs> and so I say it should be solved by the police. Yeah. I think it's be. I think you're beating around the bush. I think it, crime. <laughs> should be responded to by the police and there should be enough police in every city to respond quickly to a 911 call. Well, but, And the yeah. reason that's not the case is squarely on the defund the police and BLM um, movement but, uh, of the past three years. Yeah, but... I don't think it's that complicated. Yeah, but I would also say that you cannot separate that from... Um, you know, there's a lot of sociological research that basically says if you invest in neighborhoods, high crime a- areas become less high crime. The, the the more you invest in roads and schools and stores and things like that. So I think that it's not just about the police. Um, but anyway, the point I, uh, the point I was making before we got here was that by far the most gun death is gun suicide. It's not even mm-hmm. close. And so. The, what I start look what I look at, and in that's my book, overwhelmingly a white issue, right? It, it was in white my, white male issue. It was in my book. I mean, yeah, maybe that'll yeah. change now because but my book, the analysis yeah. ends in 2018. Yep. And I would just say that gun suicide, um, people were being targeted with, you know, the people are out to get you. You need a gun. People were overarming themselves. There were guns everywhere. And then when there was a moment of crisis. Um, they, you know, the average story, a a gun suicide, the story isn't, um, the story isn't, I've been in in therapy for 20 years and finally I did it. The Mm -hmm. story is I got really drunk. I got fired from my job. I found out my wife was having an affair. There was a gun on the nightstand. It's 59 minutes or less in a moment of overwhelming crisis. Mm. And so the people who had that life event and there was a gun on the nightstand were the people who were committing suicide. Mm -hmm. And so- It'll be interesting to see with all these black gun owners now, for example, what happens to black gun suicide. If my data is right, black gun suicide will go up also because the, the risk factor for for gun suicide is having a gun in a moment mm. of crisis. But I would mm. say that when all the rhetoric about guns is a gangbanger is going to break in your home or, a, you know, carjack you um, – you're, you're not recognizing that the biggest, at least from a health perspective, the biggest risk of guns is actually turning the gun on yourself. That's interesting. That's a very interesting prediction about black, the black suicide rate. And I'm curious, when, when would you like check, check in on that to see if, if you were right? Because that's a very interesting prediction. I don't know, 10 years from now. <laughs> 10 years from now, the yeah. black, yeah. Well, um, Yeah. So that's interesting because you do see certain countries like South Korea with with very high suicide rates, but no gun ownership. Japan. Japan. Yeah. Okay. So I guess Japan as well. And, and, um, so it's clearly possible, but you're saying the way that most suicides are happening and they're so to speak crimes of passion. And if there's nothing around to kill yourself with, and it, and the feeling passes, 
then many, many people wouldn't do it. We, we have the same rates of suicide attempt as other places. Um, but for example, overdose is the most common um, suicide attempt method. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how fatal do you think it is? Overdose? I, well, because I, I read your book, I, I kind of know the punchline. Okay, it's so. like 4%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, um, um, hanging, it's hard to do. Um, I mean, people will, we have the same number of suicide attempts mm-hmm. as other places, mm-hmm. but gun suicide is 96% fatal. Like it's just, it's very lethal means. And so mm-hmm. we're providing people with the lethal means um, with while we're increasing their anxiety and their mistrust and decreasing public health infrastructure and mental health awareness and things like that. And so it's just a toxic mix. Mm-hmm. Um, the numbers we're seeing now, I, I, I never thought in my career I would see the level of gun deaths and level of gun suicides uh, like like what we have now. We're well above 25,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Um, the gun deaths, the gun death rate is probably about 50,000 a year, which mm-hmm. is much higher suicide success rate than it is in a place like Japan or Korea. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So just backing up uh, suicide in general, what is your theory of why white people are more likely to commit suicide full stop than black people and Hispanics? Uh, well, in my research, um, so there were these famous papers from uh, Journal of the American Medical Association and other places from the 1990s that said that a gun in the home is a risk factor for a successful, successful is the word they use, suicide in the home, a completed suicide. Mm-hmm. So having a gun around increased your risk of dying from suicide. Um, it also increased the risk that there would be a fatal partner violence um, shooting, for example, if there's a gun, uh, there was a m- higher chance that a, there would be a partner shooting. Okay. Um, now, it seems kind of obvious, right? Because it's probably um, hard to have a partner shooting if there's no gun. Um, but but I would say that this these two papers, two or three papers, um, really started the public health on one side and NRA on the other side, the whole debate about why public health is anti-gun started from these papers because they were saying you're pathologizing gun owners. Now, the irony is what they said in those first papers in the 1990s, um, uh, Kellerman, other authors, they're kind of famous papers, was 100% true, which is that having a gun in the home increases the risk of having a, a completed suicide in the home. And so I think the presence of a gun in a moment where there is an overwhelming crisis, an overwhelming sense of um, this, I don't think there's anything racially distinct about having a life crisis. I do think having a gun in your nightstand was something more white Americans in Missouri had in the time of my research. So they had means to a completed suicide in a way that other people didn't. Now, black Americans were much more supportive of gun control um, because they had seen the effects of gun crime in their neighborhoods and they supported more policing for a long time. And they felt like getting the guns out of their neighborhoods made their neighborhoods safer. There was a lot of feeling for decades before 2020, yep. um, black Americans were much more supportive of gun control because they had seen what having no police and, and cause there was far more gun homicides. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I mean, so I think it strikes me that could be one cause of the higher white suicide rate and probably is, but I don't think that can explain all of it. Mm-hmm. I think, so for instance, if that explained all of it, you would expect there to be a higher rate of you know, like white interspousal homicides than black interspousal homicides. And I don't actually have the data on that. I don't know. But I know the overall black homicide rate is, you know, seven or eight times the white rate. Um, so, I mean, it seems to me if you equalized guns by race, we might still see a higher white suicide rate, that there might be some other component going on. Quite do you possibly. Think, do you think that's right? I mean, that would be interesting to see. I think it's, yeah. I think it's, I think it's also, also more basically, um, so so the numbers I looked at said 36% of white Americans have a gun and 20, 
4% of black Americans have a gun. It's 12 point percentage difference, but the suicide rate gap is like, it's like a factor of two or something. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. no, it's, 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 it's larger than would be suggested if guns were the only cause. Yeah. So yeah. do you have theories about other potential additional causes of the black white suicide gap? Yeah. I mean, again, I, I'm really curious about the next 10 years. Um, I would say that th- there are these books about the deaths of despair, for example, and racially disparate white deaths by particular kinds of overdose. There are, um, there are books about feeling like um, you're in a community that's been left behind by globalization or by all these other factors. And so, um, you know, the, the disparate white death rate, um, you know, there's a lot of economic literature out there mm-hmm. right now that I think that I think I think it'll be interesting to see. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, if you're suggesting that that's not s- separate from the anxiety and anger that like Trump tapped into by people feeling like ne- they'd never been listened before and they were being totally passed over. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that lead, leads to suicide rates, but I certainly think I wasn't gonna, suggesting that. I was yeah. just just a genuine question because yeah. I don't I don't have a strong theory. Yeah. yeah. So again, although I the whole deaths of despair thesis seems like a lot of a lot of people find that. True. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not from, I have very little personal firsthand experience with those communities. Although, you know, I'll sound like a coastal elite, which I am saying this, but I've like driven through places where there used to be a factory. <laughs> you didn't fly over. <laughs> I didn't fly over. I drove through. Yeah. And they do seem, um, they look like places that used to be thriving and are not. Yeah. No. And I could see how that could lead to deaths of despair. I mean, so broadly, right, your book is about the the policy threats to white population health. It seems to me the biggest one over the past 10 years has been these deaths of despair, the opioid crisis. You saw life expectancy in, in the white population just going up and up and up and up pretty much for decades until a few years ago. And my, 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 um, I, I thought the consensus on this was that opio- opioids were the main cause. So my my last question would be really like, one, do you agree with that overall picture as that being the biggest threat of the past 10 years or the biggest? Uh, uh, and if so, who is to blame for that? Well, I mean, I, I think the deaths of despair work is super important. Um and and it's not like I'm out there disputing it by saying no, it's guns. It's not a it's not a competition. Mm-hmm. I I think what you're suggesting is true, which is guns and opiates are kind of part of the same coin in, in a certain kind of way. Um, I certainly think that um, deaths of despair um, are are a huge issue. And in other words, like I I can't remember in my lifetime or really any lifetime. The, the demographic majority group in an industrialized country having a four year or greater life a drop in life expectancy it's it's un, it's unimaginable it's a- absolutely unimaginable and so um, I do think that there's a sense of opiates um, certainly being a massive issue that have been propagated from pharmaceutical companies and some very well-known actors given what we what we know now and physicians and everything else I, I don't think it's just coming over the southern border I think it's m- many players were involved in, in creating that that problem um, and it le- and it contributed to a kind of sense of hopelessness le- left behindness that is I think gun suicides are part of that same coin. So it's not like I'm voting one or the other. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think that the numbers of gun suicides in Missouri when I was doing my research was, was for me breathtaking, honestly. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, oh, it's better or worse than, than, um, than uh, addiction. But I would say it just, it just felt like the middle of our country is falling apart and we can't let this happen. Right. And so part of my argument, I'm not trying to play gotcha politics with white people. I, Mm -hmm. I am a white person. I am from the Midwest. What I'm saying is the minute we stopped investing in infrastructure, people feeling like they're part of some kind of infrastructure that is 
going to thrive or has a possibility of a future, this is the outcome of, of what we're seeing. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I mean, I, both of these things are problems mm -hmm. and they're probably both a reflection of the same larger issue. Okay. So before I let you go, what's your next book about? And, uh, do you, do you have a title for that or anything? When is that coming out? Uh, I'll have a title for you next week, Okay, cool. <laughs> but I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at, um, a, a mass shooting that happened in Nashville, the Nashville Waffle House mass shooting. Oh, okay. Uh, a naked white man went into a Waffle House and, um, shot, um, he, he killed, uh, four young adults of color mm -hmm. and the automatic narrative that everybody told was it, it was racism, which it was, mm -hmm. but I step back and I, and I, I look at how that story, when you really look at the story of what happened in one mass shooting, it's much more complicated than the binaries we put over it mm -hmm. are about common sense gun laws and NRA and stuff like that. And so it's in a way, what I'm showing is when you really unpack a story, it's far more complicated. And mm -hmm. actually this good guy, bad guy narrative that we have on both sides is not helping anybody because what I show is liberal gun policy also totally missed the boat of trying to what, what would it take to not have this crime happen? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about background checks and red flag laws. It was actually mm -hmm. about understanding community safety. Mm. All right. Well, on that note, Jonathan Metzl, you're out of the hot seat. All right. Thanks. That was great. All right. Thanks. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Conversations with Coleman, guys. As always, thanks for watching. And feel free to tell me what you think by reviewing the podcast, commenting on social media, or sending me an email. To check out my other social media platforms, click the cards you see on screen. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.